So here's another interesting uh, sideline of, bio, of uh, white writing, and that's bioluminescence. Uh, well, those aren't, but that one is. And you might know this one as uh, uh, Omphalotus olivescens, and its common name is the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. And it's really fun because you take it in the dark, and it really does bioluminescent, bioluminesce quite heavily in the dark. In the middle of the day, too, doesn't matter, night, night or day. Uh, the bi bioluminescence is about 520 nanometers, kind of green light, occurs 24 hours a day, and we even know what luciferin is. There's an enzymatic relationship between this compound that is oxidized and, and puts out light. So luciferin in fungi is, is his, histidine, I'm sorry, hispidin. So that was re a recent discovery as well. So why do these bioluminescent mushrooms, why do, they, why do they grow in the dark? Well, it turns out there's three different lineages, the Omphalotus lineage, the Armillaria lineage, and the Mycena lineage. And, and there's about well, 70 or so bioluminescent species. And we know that they're all white rock basidiomycetes. So if that's the case, there must be something about those peroxides. And it makes sense. React, they're, they're these reactive oxygen species. They're, they're, they're toxic physiologically. They cause this incredible oxidative stress. And they're and, and his, his is an antioxidant. And so it relieves that oxidative stress. So bioluminescence is a, a way of relieving oxidative stress from the peroxides. So uh, antioxidant, that sounds medicinal. So um, are then all these, these white rot bioluminescent mushrooms medicinal? What do you think? Uh, let's see. Felinus is a medicinal mushroom, and it's known to be an antioxidant and anti-tumor and an anti-diabetic. That's interesting. How about the jack-o'-lantern itself? It contains this terrible poison called uh, sesquiterpene called eludin S. Well, now it's in uh, clinical trials as an anti-tumor um, medicine. How about all white rods? Could they possibly all be medicinal? Well, here's turkey tail. Let's see. Ah, PSK and PSP. They're protein-bound polysaccharides that uh, are in clinical trials for cancer immunotherapy. Here's pleurotus itself, the oyster mushroom. I just thought that was good food. But it makes lovastatin. Anybody taking lovastatin besides me? It's a cholesterol drug. So this is sounding pretty interesting. Uh, lentinus, the shiitake. Again, I thought it was just good food. But it makes lentinin, which is a polysaccharide, uh, which is in clinical trials as a stomach cancer adjuvant. <laughs> so, uh, Ganoderma, Ganoderic acids. This is, you know, Ling Chi. It's, uh, this is not Ling Chi, but Ling Chi is a Ganoderic, Ganoderma with gan its own Ganoderic acids. Tritropinoids, liver protection, anti tumor activity. Boy, it's looking pretty interesting here that there might be a link between these, between their mode of decomposition and their ability to serve as, as uh, medicinals. So here's a living tree now, and they've got, you know, they're trying to protect themselves. How do they do it? Well, the inner bark and the outer bark. Uh, the inner bark is, well, they're both resistant, passive resistant to insect attack. They have uh, lignans, tannins, superids, waxes, resins, flavonoids, etc. Let's talk about resins first. I know you have seen this, the, the pitch dripped onto your car, etc. This is. Uh, this is toxic stuff if you're an insect or a, or a fungus, and you have to work really hard to get through it. It's got this uh, tropamine called pinene in it, and plus it's mechanically really difficult to get through. Now this guy is working on some outer bark here, stripping it, and it's got a flavonoid in it called cinnamaldehyde. So what tree do you suppose that is? Cinnamon. Cinnamon tree. So these, that's, it's, a, it's a potent insecticide and, and fungicide. So the trees are fighting back here. Tannins, we know about tannins in bark. This guy is, is skinning this tree here. And look at that structure of tannic acid. It looks like lignin. Well, it's a polyphenol. 
It's an antioxidant. One of the yeah. reasons wine's good for you in coffee. Okay? Quercetinic acid is in bark. This is what they use to tan hides, tannic acid, to tan hides. It cross-links and it binds the proteins. They're unavailable un un now for degradation by fungi and bacteria once they're bound up. So coffee has got tannins in it, wine, of course. Even the wine cork is a way of protecting against fungi and insects. So we know about inner bark. How about the cambium layer? It's an active response to fungal attack. Because of CODIT, you might know Alex Shigo's work, where uh, he talks about compartmentalization. Once there's been an attack by insect or fungus, the, the cambium starts producing more wood with more lignin, increased lignin production. Here's the sap with the heartwood. Uh, the, the heartwood is waste storage. Sapwood is where the water is conducted. You see that, that uh, waste storage area of the, sap of the heartwood is full. It's even more pigmented. It's colorful. It's full of uh, um, phenols and tannins and resins and terpenes and all kinds of things, which is chemical resistant to insects and, and fungi again. Whereas the sapwood contains things that sound like pretty good food to us, and that's stored in the rays, these radiating lines of parenchyma cells. So if they can, you know, the, if they can have access to that sapwood, that'd be pretty, pretty tasty stuff and pretty usable stuff without any of the bad stuff that's in the heartwood. So there's an active response to fungal attack in the sapwood as well, as there is in the cambium. And here it is. There's a systemic acquired resistance called SAR, and it's triggered by any pathogenic attack. And it's like our own immune system, which is hard to believe that plants, you know, we don't give them credit for being anywhere near as sophisticated we are physiologically, but it turns out they are. And it involves the production of, of salicylic acid, which is sounding familiar. What is that? Yeah, it's a phenolic. You see the phenol compound again. And it's first originally isolated from willow bark, and it's aspirin, essentially, salicylic acid. And it's produced by plants under attack. And it triggers this activation of these pathogenesis-related genes. So. Insect bites or fungus enters, the plant physiology changes in the living cells, and it produces this aspirin analog called, called uh, uh, salicylic acid or salicylate. And it, and it triggers genes to come on, which starts to produce these pathogenesis-related proteins, such as chitinase. So the tree is now producing chitinase. What do you suppose that might be called? Where have you seen chitin before in this lecture? Insect and fungi, so. There they are. I take both of them. It, it, it keeps both of them at bay. And it, even this, this salicylic acid, there's, a, there's a, a volatile form of it. So one tree under attack can give it out into the air and turn the other trees on. So they're ready for the attack. So that being said, you look up in the woods here and you see all these dead trees and you go, well, the system's not working so well. But then again, you see pandemics in us too. So, you know, we're doing the best we can to fight these things. But, uh, the fungi and the insects always seem to win. Okay. So secondary metabolites of plants is what we've been talking about. They're not directly involved in the world development of reproduction. They're defense against attack. Terpenoids like tetrahydrocannabinol, polyphenols like salicylic acid, tannins, flavonoids, resveratrol in, in uh, wine, vanillin, oh, I've got a great story about vanillin, but we're out of time. Um, alkaloids like atropine, and, and, and you've seen all these names before too, mescaline, morphine, nicotine, vincristine, the anti-cancer stuff. These are, these are all secondary metabolites of plants that they produce in response to being attacked. And we use them, we think of them as, as food, uh, I'm sorry, as medicine, and nutraceuticals, and flavorings, and even recreational drugs. Um, do fungi have any secondary metabolites? More than we have time even to mention, and I didn't even put down most of the ones that I found doing the search, because I didn't even know what they were. And they're finding so many 
new ones all the time. Um, so it's, it's an interesting, uh, kind of like going down the rabbit hole. You start to ask a question about, you know, how do fungi really rot the, uh, the fabric of life? And you end up far afield because it's all interconnected. And like H.L. Mencken said, you know, for every complex problem, there's a, a clear and simple solution that's wrong. Because the, the, the reality of it is much more complex. So um, I think it's time for your quiz. Uh, no, that's all right. We don't need a quiz. Um, let's go out in the woods. Anyway.